you now are doctors Jack and Rexella Van Empe. Hello, friends, and welcome to Jack Van Empe Presents. And since that is what I say every single week on this program, Jack Van Impey, I'm so sorry to say that Jack will not be with us today. And uh, there's a very, very good reason I'm going to ask you to pray about it. We were walking out of the doctor's office, and because of uh, his cane sticking into the sidewalk, because the sidewalk was broken, he went right down, and he really had a fall. But uh, he said, you tell the people I will be back as soon as possible. So he's not going to be out very long. But he really could not be with us today. So we're going to be, but when I say he's not going to be with us, I'm going to be inserting some things that he's done and that he said, and uh, maybe some things you haven't even seen, which will be good too. So uh, do put him in your prayers, if you will, please. He certainly loves to be here serving the Lord. That's his life. And it has always been his life and calling. Now, he said we want to concentrate, of course, on something that just happened and is very, very meaningful to the world. And that is the home going of Billy Graham. Oh, my, oh, my. He meant so much to the world. The Reverend Billy Graham, one of the most influential Christian pastors of the 20th century, who ministered to presidents, I'm going to name some in a moment, to more than 200 million people worldwide and helped to popularize evangelical Christianity in the United States. Well, he did all of that and even more, won so many to the Lord. And uh, although I never met him, my husband did, and I'm going to tell you about that in just a moment, too. But um, he certainly had an influence on so many presidents, starting with Dwight Eisenhower, Lyndon Johnson, and Richard Nixon. Even during the Watergate scandal, he talked to President Nixon and uh, had a great influence in his life. And then, of course, he visited the White House a lot under President Ronald Reagan, and uh, he prayed at Bill Clinton's 1993 inauguration and played a big role in George W. Bush's decision before he became president to stop drinking. And I'm going to read something that he had to say about that. Oh, my, I love this so very much. It, to it shows what a personal touch Dr. Graham has had on lives. He said, I met Dr. Graham in 1985. He cared and his teachings began my faith walk and helped me quit drinking. I had the joy of interviewing Barbara Bush, of course, the mother of um, him, and he also influenced her life. And in this article, he says how they called him one night and they said, oh, people, you know, if they do good, they can get to heaven and so forth. And this is what he had to say to Barbara. Barbara and George, I believe what is written in the New Testament. But don't play God. He decides who's going to heaven. In other words, he was telling them, you can't get to heaven through good works. When I interviewed Barbara, now I understand why she had her faith in the Lord alone. Wonderful, wonderful lady. And I thank the Lord so much how he was so down to earth. He could reach people on a very different level. Franklin Graham, his son, said this, I'm so thankful he never gave up on me or quit loving me because he drifted away from the Lord, too. And my, oh, my, how wonderful it is to know that he is now with the Lord. And he said this, My father has gone home. No doubt about it. My father has joined my mother in heaven. He went to sleep in his home in the beautiful mountains of North Carolina and woke up in the arms of Jesus. While many around the world mourn his physical death, he is now celebrating the eternal life he spent over 70 years telling millions of people about. Somebody else that he really influenced, and that was Jack Van Impey, because he really started Jack in the right direction. Jack was 17 years old, 
and he was already in Bible college. He didn't really know exactly the direction he was going to go because he really was in music. But he thought, oh my, I'd love to be able to preach. When he met Billy Graham, Billy Graham uh, was in Canada. My husband went over to play for this rally. And this is the humility of Billy Graham. He went over and he said to Jack, you know, Jack, if I could play the accordion like this, I'd quit preaching. Can you imagine the humility and love that he showed? It made a great influence on Jack. Whoa. But he said, Jack, you've got more than that. You've got more than that. You've got to start preaching. I'm going to get you some youth rallies. And that began Jack Van Impe in the ministry. He got these youth rallies for my husband. But, uh, you know, he continued playing the accordion for many, many years after that, along with his meetings. Now, I don't think you've ever heard him play the accordion on any of our programs. So I'm going to have him play uh, that one that was recorded a while back. I trust that you'll see how great he really was. And uh, But God called him into something even greater. All right? to hear him play the accordion and uh, he continued playing the accordion many years he laid it aside and said you know I, I really don't have time for any more of the accordion and physically he couldn't do it anymore so he laid it aside but he kept going and I would like for you to see something else now it has to do with how God blessed him when he started to preach sort of a little uh, condensed life story when he was young and how God developed his preaching ability and that became number one in his life. I watched him, you know, he was well into his ministry when I met him. He came to our church to preach and after we were married I used to watch him study the Word of God and memorize. He memorized 18,000 verses and I would watch him about three hours a day. He would get into the Word four hours a day and then he'd go over and practice the accordion for a while at the church or the arena or wherever we were. But the Word of God was number one. Take a look at what we put together for his life story. Anyone familiar with Jack knows how much he enjoys life and loves to have a good time. It's difficult to find a picture of him where he isn't smiling. Here's one of his first. And this one where he's practicing his Billy Graham pose as a young Bible school student. He's always ready for a good laugh and not afraid to provide one at his own expense. It's just the way he is. And it's this self-effacing, down-to-earth, real people quality that has drawn so many to his ministry and to Christ. 
His work began when he was just 17, and his parents announced they were traveling to the mission fields of Belgium. One can only imagine his feelings as they turned to leave and he realized he'd have to make it completely on his own. He'd already gained quite a reputation as a musician, so those initial years of his work found him performing on his accordion with the likes of Billy Graham, George Beverly Shea, Cliff Barrows, Leonard Thompson, and at Youth for Christ meetings. These early years in Bible college laid the foundation for another enduring Van Empey trademark, his amazing memory. To this day, his gift for memorization and rapid-fire recitation of verses continues to fascinate his viewers and effectively teach as few other techniques can. He'd prepared himself well. He had scripture committed to memory. He had his music. What else could a dedicated young minister ask for? Of course, a wife. And so typical of the Lord, he provided just the right woman to blend perfectly with a man. Throughout the years, they've shared it all. The music, the ministry, and the cats. For up to 40 weeks per year, 12 years in a row, it was life on the road in church crusades as ambassadors for Christ. This was followed by area-wide city crusades, television specials, radio, and now weekly television programs. All the time standing shoulder to shoulder with Jack, Rexella has provided the perfect blend of helpmate, homemaker, confidant, and truest friend. The two are inseparable and as single-minded in their dedication to the Lord as two people can be. As Dr. Van Empey has said, I wouldn't be in the ministry today without her. And to be sure, the ministry would have taken on a much different look without Rexella. Area-wide crusades in the state's top 260. Many of these were broadcast as nationwide television specials from places like Carnegie Hall, the stage of the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville, the Waikiki Shell in Honolulu, the Los Angeles Convention Center, and many others. This U.S. crusade circuit was interrupted from time to time with a worldwide outreach that began in South America and took the Van Epies to 50 countries. The early 70s saw the start of a radio outreach that within several years was being translated into 83 languages around the globe. During this flurry of Christian evangelism, some 10 million people had attended the Van Epi's mass crusades, with 600,000 being saved or restored to Christ. Then it all abruptly stopped. The Lord had shown Jack that it was time to speak out about a disease growing in the body of Christ, a disease which threatened to tear it apart. In his book, Heart Disease in Christ's Body, and in a courageous keynote address to his peers at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention, Dr. Van Epi exposed the senseless discrimination and separatist attitudes which had infiltrated Christianity. This lone voice speaking out for true Christian unity and fellowship with all of God's people would forever have as its centerpiece Christ's unfathomable love for all who believe. This new attitude demanded to be shouted from the rooftops. And so in 1980, Jack Van Epi Presents, a new weekly television program was born. It combined the talents of Rexella as masterful interviewer and first lady of sacred song with doctors' incomparable teaching style and powerful messages. The program sometimes originated from global venues like London and the Holy Land. Those hour-long specials continued as well from places like Washington, D.C. and Israel. These new endeavors were a resounding success. The ministry was now reaching more people in a single telecast. The Lord blessed the Van Epi's faithfulness with some of his own, and in 1988, a new Jack Van Epi Presents hit the airwaves. The program's format, unique in all of television, Features Rexella reading up-to-the-minute news reports and headlines. Introducing all the visuals, including Doctor's favorites, the cartoons. 
Then Doctor takes over for his unique analysis, clarification in biblical commentary. This is where his years of diligent study, evidenced by his 17 doctorates and his amazing memory, take over. In a blizzard of quotes from sacred scripture, he can humble the arrogant or bless the believer. Nobody does it better. Rexella, always the pivot point of the anchor team, adds just the right tender touch of her own, and it's off to a new topic. In 2008, doctors Jack and Rexella decided to give the program a fresh new look. From the heartland of America to every nation on earth, this is Jack Van Empe Presents The Truth in News and Commentary. Here now are doctors Jack and Rexella Van Empe. Hello and welcome to Jack Van Empe Presents. Oh, I'm so happy that I could share that portion of his life with you. But there's so much more about Jack that I would love to just share today. And it has to do with his preaching. That's the main focus that he has had ever since I've known him and ever since I think he was 17 years old, preaching. And I think you're going to see uh, a little bit of uh, Billy Graham's style here and how he reaches the audience with uh, not only the, the Word of God but with his compassion and wanting to win souls for Christ. In fact, you'll even see him give an invitation. So take a look. At Jack Van MP, we're going to start right in sort of like the middle of a message because of the time element. And you'll hear him preaching. The second and final attribute of God that I want to discuss is love. Not only is he holy, but he's love. God is love, 1 John 4, 8. When one becomes born again, remember that term, regeneration? He receives God's nature. Holiness and love. I'm afraid that there are millions of people around the world who claim to be born again who aren't. For all they do is hate, hate everyone and anything. Our churches are full of people who are fighting, fussing, bickering. They're always criticizing, always gossiping, always running one another down. Something's wrong with that kind of Christianity. God is love, and when the God of love comes to dwell in a human body, the love also rubs off internally. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. I repeat it, he that loveth not knoweth not God. You can't hate everybody and everything and really be born again. The love of God in you makes that an impossibility. 1 John 4, verses 7 and 8. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there's none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. 1 John 2, verses 9 to 11. In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. This is God speaking through his word. Two groups, children of God and children of the devil. Who's who? Whosoever practiseth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us. 1 John 4, 12. If a man say, I love God, but hate his brother, he's a liar. Ouch! The Holy Spirit said that in 1 John 4, 20. It's so easy to say, I love the Lord. Oh, how I love Jesus and hate everyone else in the community, and hate everyone in the neighborhood, and hate everyone at the church. If I were as bitter, filled with as much hatred as some of you who name the name of Jesus Christ are, I'd fall on my knees and examine myself to see whether I was really in the faith, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. You cannot be full of hate and be genuinely born again. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, because you have love. One for another. Who said that? Jesus, John 13, 35. Oh, we talk about the gifts. We talk about sacrifice. It's all meaningless if there's no love. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I'm become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. 
And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge so that I can remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. Get ready for the shocker. Though I bestow my goods to feed the poor and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 to 4. Imagine, go to the bank, get out all your savings, distribute it to the poor, let them tie your body to the stake and burn you and die in defense of the faith. And he says, even that profits nothing when you meet Jesus if your heart was not filled with love for other Christians. I'll tell you, we need an old-fashioned revival in this country where the people of God will fall on their knees and ask God to forgive them for their gossip, for their hatred, for their malice, for the malignant spirit as they maliciously try to destroy one another. We need a revival of love in our nation, love in our homes, love in our churches. That's the proof we're saved. Holiness and love are the two attributes of God. And when God comes in, regeneration, those two attributes rub off. And I'm going to say it very dogmatically, ladies and gentlemen, if you cannot find either one of these two evidences in the life, something's wrong. If you're a Christian, don't ever touch the Lord's Supper if you've got bitterness in your heart toward the others. Don't partake of the Holy Communion. It's dangerous business. They came to the Lord's table in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 31. And God said, Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, with unconfessed sin in the life, eateth and drinketh damnation to his body. Not the soul, that can't be done, but to the body. Because of it, many Christians are weak and sickly, and many sleep, many are prematurely buried. Now, what was one of the sins? Chapter 1, verse 11, It hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the household of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Fighting. 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. There are divisions among you. Contentions, chapter 1. Divisions, fighting, fussing, fuming, criticizing, gossiping. I'll tell you, our churches across the nation are full of people who are constantly at one another. And they destroy ministers with their tongues. And they destroy one another. Are you really saved? If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, his religion is vain. You can go to prayer in a moment and bow your heads and say, Do I really have it? To be born again is to receive Jesus Christ. It's that simple. I've proven it. And when one is born again, God's nature enters regeneration. God is holy. God is love. And I'm pleading with you in the name of Christ. I'm pleading with you in the name of your never dying soul within your body. It's going to live forever and forever and forever somewhere. Be sure you're saved. How? First of all, do you have the evidence of holiness in your daily walk? Secondly, do you have the evidence of love? I'm going to ask you now, as you bow your heads with me, to ask God to save you, that you might have a born-again experience this very moment, and that these things will become true, perhaps for the first time in your life. If you cannot find holy living and love filling the heart, do something about it right now, will you? Let's pray. Father, we ask that the Holy Spirit of God may take the words of God and apply them to our hearts. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I'm going to ask you right this moment to receive Jesus Christ. Right in the quietness of this moment, will you pray this prayer? Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me now. I trust in your shed blood. The moment one does that, he becomes a son or daughter of God, becomes born again. Will you who are Christians know walked away from God. You're not living for Him. You cannot find this love. You're not what you once were. Pray this, Lord, I'm coming home. I'm coming back. I've wandered far from you. Come on, take time to pray. Think seriously. This has been a strong Bible message. I make no apologies for it. It's the Word of God. And the proof that you are saved is the way you live now that you're saved. 
You are now living a holy life. The things of the world are gone. You're sick of it all. And now the love of God is filling you and you love other Christians. There's a change. If you don't have it, get saved now. Receive Jesus now. Come back to God now. Father, meet the needs in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, my, oh, my, what a message. And I'm sure you can see perhaps the, the effect that Billy Graham had on Doctor's life, saying you need to be preaching. The Lord guided Dr. Billy Graham when he spoke to Jack that day and opened all the doors for Youth for Christ for Jack that day. Now, did you make that decision? Please write to me and I'd be happy to send you this little booklet for steps in a new direction. I don't care what direction you've gone. It's so wonderful to know that the message or part of that message that you just heard from Jack Van Yimpy says that you can be cleansed of anything. Whatever direction you're going, you can turn it around. First steps in a new direction. God wants to walk with you in every area of your life. So please write. I'll send you that little book of first steps in a new direction. It'll be our joy. You know, I want to thank the Lord so very, very much today for something that goes along with my thought. I always give you a little thought at the end. We don't need more to be thankful for. We just need to be more thankful. And we don't spend enough time thanking the Lord, do we? I want to thank the Lord right now that Jack wasn't hurt more extensively than he was. Yes, he's all bruised up. Oh, my, oh, my, I've never seen anything like it. But he's not broken. In fact, at the hospital, they couldn't even believe they gave him a couple of MRIs because they thought he'd have a fractured skull. But he didn't thank the Lord. And uh, so I just want to remember this in this uh, very, very special way. We don't need more to be thankful for. We just to be, need to be more thankful. Are you thankful to the Lord in your life? As you walk with him, we need to be thanking him every day for that wonderful gift of salvation, for the wonderful walk that we have with him in knowing that the Lord is with us every single day. When I left today, Jack said, be sure and give the people my love. My prayers are with them, and I will be back, I promise. I'm going to try to be back uh, even sooner than uh, the doctor said that I would probably be out of the house. Okay, friends, once again, we don't need more to be thankful for. We just need to be more thankful. God bless you. We'll look forward to being with you again next week. <laughs> 